Israelis have been fighting terrorism since well before the establishment of the state, and with pretty mixed results. In response to terrorist attacks on the border, General Moshe Dayan and Colonel Ariel Sharon created the legendary, and many would say notorious, Unit 101, Israel's first special ops team. But the unit was ultimately pretty short-lived, ending in controversy. What led to Unit 101's disbanding only five months after its creation? And what impact did it have on the new state? Terrorism had been happening in Israel since way before it declared statehood. Two massacres in 1929 killed 87 Jews and wounded 138 more. 21 were murdered during the Bloody Day in Jaffa in 1936. Attacks in 1937 saw three children and a parent shot dead in their Tzfat home, and five Jews killed in an ambush near Har Haruach. Six Jews were killed while traveling from Haifa to Tzfat in 1938, and the 1938 Tiberius pogrom left 19 dead. The 40s also saw a steady string of attacks in which hundreds more were killed. The attacks didn't stop after Israel achieved independence in 1948. Terrorists, who were called fedayin, or self-sacrificers in Arabic, began crossing the border regularly from Jordan in the east and Egypt in the southwest to carry out attacks against Israeli civilians. And when I say regularly, I mean thousands of infiltrations and attacks that killed hundreds. So fear was a part of everyday life for Jews in Israel, both before and after it declared independence. Many Israelis had survived the Holocaust as well as a traumatic war of independence that saw some 6,000 Israeli casualties. And these terrorist attacks just reminded them that they were still vulnerable. Israel was at a loss as to how to defend its citizens. Today, the Israel Defense Force might make you think of military might and super high-tech counterterrorism units. But back then, Israel was still just a fledgling state in its early informative years, under attack from all sides even after the 1948 war had officially ended. And the concept of counterterrorism wasn't really a thing yet. This brings us to Ariel Sharon. After four Palestinian Fedayeen attacks killed three Jews and wounded six more within a two-week period in the summer of 1953, Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion's administration reached a breaking point and said enough was enough. The newly sovereign state of Israel would protect its citizens and would not allow terrorist invasions to continue. I mean, sounds reasonable enough, right? But what should they do? So, in August 1953, Unit 101 was formed, a commando unit of 50 men chosen by invitation only and led by Ariel Sharon. The 101 would cross borders, strike terrorist bases in Jordan and Egypt, and disappear like ghosts. So, when a family in the village of Yehud was murdered by a grenade lobbed through their window as they slept, Unit 101 took action. Many of the terrorist Fadiyin were believed to be based in or near the Jordanian West Bank village of Kibya, so that is where the 101 went. The choice of target would later become a national dispute. On the night of October 14, 1953, Unit 101, along with an IDF company, infiltrated Jordan, fired mortars, and inflicted heavy damage on Kibya. If Fedayeen wanted to throw bombs through the windows of quiet Israeli homes, the 101 could play that game. The 101 chose their demolition targets, shouted a warning into the buildings, causing villagers to flee, and blew up dozens of buildings in a single strike. But tragically, they didn't just demolish buildings and kill terrorists. The soldiers of the 101 soon realized that they were responsible for the deaths of about 60 civilians, two-thirds of whom were women and children. Ariel Sharon believed that many villagers were hiding in the buildings and simply didn't hear the soldiers' warnings. This was a travesty, but here's the uncomfortable reality. After Kibia, the wave of terror along the Jordanian border did dry up. These reprisal attacks were a moral conundrum, and it was difficult for Israel to justify them. But Ben-Gurion believed that they were necessary to show the Arabs that Israel was here to stay. At the same time, he couldn't have the world thinking that the IDF was involved. So, in an effort to save face, he officially claimed that Jewish civilians living on the border carried out the raid. Many Israelis, like Foreign Minister Moshe Sharet, thought this was a ridiculous claim. Condemnation spread from without and within, but many insiders saw it as just the cost of war. Members of the 101 did the dirty work soldiers are sometimes asked to do. Their reactions ranged from, we were just doing our job, to, oh my god, what have we done? Originally, General Moshe Dayan had expressed strong reservations about the formation of Unit 101 as a division designed solely for retaliation. But ultimately, he reversed his position and became one of the architects of the Kibia attack. After the attack, he didn't sidestep the controversy and said, quote, we can exact a high price for our blood, one that Arab regimes will not consider worth paying. Every Dayan in the government was counterpointed by leaders like Ambassador to the U.S., Abba Iban, or Foreign Minister Moshe Sharet, who were horrified and embarrassed by the events 
and doubted whether reprisals actually brought the security they were intended to bring. But the numbers spoke for themselves. The decrease in Fedayeen attacks indicated that the 101's attacks were in fact effective. After the controversy of Kibya though, Unit 101 was disbanded. So where does this leave us? Israel, as a state, spent over two decades fighting people who were trying to massacre Israelis daily. And after the tragic events at Kibya, terrorism on the Jordanian border did go down. But was it worth the cost? As Hemingway wrote, quote, never think that war, no matter how necessary nor how justified, is not a crime. In war, even with an army that has a strong code of ethics, terrible things will occur, whether on purpose or by accident. In the immortal words of Civil War Union General Sherman, war is hell. So how do Israelis deal with survival while under attack from all sides, while still trying to maintain the moral high ground that Israeli society aspires to? How does any democracy deal with what it believes to be a justified ethical war, while still knowing that unethical tragedies will undoubtedly occur? <laughs>